welcome back. We are going to be talking about the gas giants today. And unlike the other planets that are the terrestrial planets, I'm going to put all the gas giants basically together. So we're going to look at Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which are the four outer planets. So we've gone through through Mars, we've gone through the asteroid belt, which we will actually come back and talk about. And then we've got the gas giants. So guys, let's go ahead and start talking about the giant planets. So those are the four outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Generally talk about them as the four gas giants. And so they're composed much of the mass of the solar system, certainly outside the sun. And in fact, for Jupiter, Jupiter is the largest of all the other planets combined. So it's definitely out there. They also tend to be hydrogen-based and not oxygen. Well, I know you, a lot of you probably haven't taken chemistry, but what that really means is I have a reducing atmosphere and it's not an oxidizing atmosphere. Hence, I'm not going to form a lot of rust out there because I don't have those types of chemical reactions that are going to occur. And so the gas giants form further out from the sun, you know, because they are our outer planets. Although when I say that, guys, probably in the beginning of the solar system, when we talk more about the solar system um, and the formation of the solar system with stars, we find out that maybe those gas giants didn't all necessarily start where they actually are now. So we think the solar system probably had more of the gas giants toward the sun, things like that. But we will talk about that when we talk about how stars form and how solar systems form around stars. But they are certainly further out from the sun right now. And therefore, the internal energies of the various chemicals are going to be lower because they are cooler. And so because they are lower, they are made out of gases, but they are not moving nearly as fast. And so they tended to go ahead and coalesce and condense as opposed to flying away. I mean, I'm never going to have hydrogen in our atmosphere because we're much too close to the sun. That hydrogen is going to be much too energetic for the Earth to go ahead and, and gravitationally hold on to it. So it's going to go ahead and leave. Also, because they are the gas giants, as more material condenses, then that gravitational attraction increased, and that caused then the planet to get larger. And because it got larger, it in turn was then able to attract more mass. So you have that kind of cycle right there that gets us to what we see today. Now, because they are further out, that hydrogen and those other volatile materials were able to stay around and form compounds. And so a compound that we see on the gas giants includes sulfur, nitrogen, chlorine, lots of hydrocarbons, you know, oxygen in combination with other things, not free oxygen, you know, and they combined in lots of ways. And so that's going to give us the color as well as some of the characteristics and behaviors of what we see the gas giants doing. Also, helium, which is the second lightest element, and helium is a noble gas, so it's not going to react well with anything. It also stayed around because it was cold enough to go ahead and pull it in. Now, I gave you a list of chemicals, but those chemicals will go ahead and tend to combine and form methane, which is CH4, ammonia, ammonium hydrosulfide, which is NH4, hydrocarbons, lots of hydrocarbons, and some other elements. And we think of, though, really, I mean, talk about those planets as gas giants. Certainly, you are going to see gas in the outer layers of those planets. But when we get down and more into the interior part of both Jupiter and Saturn, I want you to think of them as more of a liquid giant, and Uranus and Neptune as more of an icy giant. So we're getting to more of that liquid state within the layers of Jupiter and Saturn and within Uranus and Neptune, because they are smaller than Jupiter and Saturn, we're more getting those icy materials. Like I said, only the thin outside layers are really gases. Uranus was first observed in 19, uh, 19, in 1690. Uh, but when it was, it was categorized as a star that kind of was moving against the background of stars, which was you know, something different than most stars did. It was seen several more times over the years, but was not recognized as a planet itself. Now, remember the planets that we knew, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, those were all very recognizable as being planets, and the fact that they did indeed wander against the background of stars. So here we had really faint star that generally very, very um, a small amount moved against the background of stars. 
So it wasn't recognized then as an actual planet. Then in 1781, it was observed by William Herschel, but he thought it was a comet. So still, again, didn't recognize it as actually being a planet, which means, guys, when you think about what he thought it was a comet, that means he's actually seeing an appreciable disk. It might have been a really small disk, but it was actually a disk when he looked at it, not so much a point of light like what it would have been in terms of a star. Continued observing that, it was recognized as a planet about two years later in 1783. Now, that was a big deal when Herschel went ahead and discovered the next planets. The first one that had been discovered basically since mankind had been around. All the rest of them were known from the original times. And so he was given the honor of naming it. He named it after King George III. Well, that was not really popular outside of England, and so he did have to go ahead and back off of that name. And so in keeping with the rest of the traditions of naming him after gods and goddesses, things like that, then the name finally was given to the planet as Uranus. Next planet that was observed was Neptune. It was the first observed by Galileo way back in 1612. Again, it was observed more as a star. Remember, guys, these things are really far out, so they're not going to be moving a whole lot over you know, several years. And it's going to take them a while to go ahead and go around the sun. Just like Uranus, he did recognize that it moved against the background of stars, and so maybe then it was a star that was a little bit closer. Then in 1812, you had a couple of people doing some research on this, um, and you have Alex uh, Boulevard that published a table that described Uranus's motion. Because now that Uranus was known, what's it doing out there? Well, you have that motion, and so you can very carefully calculate where you think that Uranus is going to be. And as it turned out, it wasn't there. It tended to get further and further and further out of that alignment on where you thought it would be. Well couple of things. Number one, your calculations could be wrong. They didn't think they were wrong. So therefore, there maybe had to be some other body out there that was really going ahead and perturbing Uranus's motion. And so came up with then hypothesizing that another planet existed that was indeed influ influencing the orbit of Uranus. So therefore, once it was calculated, then it was given to a number of astronomers who went out there, turned the telescope up there, found where it was. Now, the problem was that it was really identified and calculated by several people. Um, and kind of interesting to go back and look at the history of who actually observed it first and what happened so that it wasn't observed by the other person. And so there were problems between France and Britain over exactly who did observe it first and who should get credit. And um, I think now you still have a little bit of that controversy still going on. Um, but eventually it was determined that it was another planet and it was given the name Neptune. Now, we want to know what's out there. I mean, we know that we've got eight planets, of course, minus poor little Pluto. We'll talk about it in the next section. There are six probes that started out in terms of the explore, exploration of the solar system. Five of them were from the U.S. and one from Europe. Now, there are lots and lots of probes out there from a variety of countries. But now when you think about what has to happen, guys, these probes have to carry their own fuel. They have to maintain their own heat source because they're heading out the solar system, and it's going to get really cold out on those outer edges. And so if you want those probes to go ahead and be able to send data back, they've got to be able to maintain a heat source to run the computers to allow the information to be sent back. They've got to be able to maintain contact with the Earth, and they've also got to be able to solve problems on their own. Because, you know, you can't turn around and ask Houston, what do you need to do, if you're way past, you know, Uranus's orbit. So when you build these probes, you have to take a lot into account because, man, once you send them out, that's it. You've got to be able to go ahead and communicate with it, but it's got to be able to handle a number of items on its own. So Pioneer was the first. Now, I'm just going to talk basically about the ones that were sent out by the United States. Pioneer was the first man-made object to go ahead and leave the solar system, and it's headed on its way out right now. 
Pioneer 10 kind of headed out toward the outer part of the solar system because we want to find out what's, out what's going on with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and especially Jupiter and Saturn. You know, Uranus and Neptune kind of got visited just because they were all lined up to start with. Now we're sending them out to Uranus and Neptune. But when they first went out, they were heading out to see what was going on with Jupiter and what was going on with Saturn. So Pioneer 10 went to Jupiter and Pioneer 11 basically went to Saturn. And there was a couple of things these probes were trying to establish. First of all, was it possible to make it through the asteroid belt? And we think about those asteroids, and we're going to talk about those more toward our last section within this um, unit. But that's an asteroid belt that's made up of all kinds of chunks of rock between Mars's orbit and Jupiter's orbit. Yeah. Not exactly sure how thick that asteroid belt was going to be. You know, was it when you went through it, were you going to get hit by an asteroid and completely destroyed? Exactly what was going to happen. And so Pioneer 10, as with a lot of the pioneers, but certainly Pioneer 10, was it going to make it through the asteroid belt? And then, if it did make it through the asteroid belt, could it survive and measure Jupiter's really massive magnetic field? And so there was several things that Pioneer 10 was designed to go ahead and do, as well as take lots and lots and lots of photographs and measurements. And find out, guys, it did just fine going through the asteroid belt and certainly did survive and manage or measure Jupiter's massive magnetic field. Then you also have Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and they were launched in 1977, and they also carried scientific instruments, just like what the others did. Voyager 1 reached Jupiter in about 1979, and it reached Saturn in about 1980. Voyager 2, on the other hand, reached Jupiter about four months later, and then Saturn in 1981. Notice here, we did go ahead and we're heading out to Uranus and Neptune. So we took photographs of Uranus in 1986, and it reached Neptune then in 1989. Now notice, guys, it was launched in 1977, and it didn't reach Neptune until 1989. So there was a significant time lag between the time that it was launched and when it actually made it past Neptune. So that heat source that I talked about, you want to be able to maintain the contact with the Earth, things like that. Now what Voyager did and what allowed it to go ahead and visit Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune was the fact that every 175 years, the planets tend to go ahead and line up. You know, they're called that planetary alignment. And so once you went past Jupiter, then heading on out, you also had Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And so Voyager certainly then was able to take advantage of that. So here is Pioneer. That's, it's not really very big. But again, it was able to go to Jupiter and Saturn. And one of the things, thanks to Carl Sagan, that Pioneer carried was a plaque. This is a plaque that was on Pioneer, both 10 and 11. And this plaque was put there so that if somebody out there picked up Pioneer, 10 or 11, that we were trying to tell them something about us. You know, are we alone in the universe? Are we alone in our solar system? We don't know. But what are the chances that Pioneer could be discovered by some other race out there? So guys, I want you to look at this picture, and let's talk about it just for a second. Um, you see a man and a woman, and they are not holding hands. There was some original descriptions to go ahead and have them hold hands, but it was decided they did that. Possibly whoever picked it up would not realize that those are two separate entities. The man does his, have his hand raised in the universal sign of peace. Is that a universal sign? Probably not. But again, showing that there was nothing there, showing that the arm could move, things like that. Showing that the man is a little bit larger than the woman. Then right behind it, to give them a scale of how tall people were, is a description, or excuse me, an image of then the spacecraft itself. So somebody found the spacecraft, they knew how big it was, they get a feel then for the size that our two genders were. Now the other thing I want you to notice is down there at the bottom, you see the sun, or at least a representation of the sun, and you see planets going out. Now you're going to see nine because there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, 
Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Notice it coming from the third planet out and heading out up toward the solar system. So heading out and up. So it's actually out, heading out of our, the plane of our solar system. You have Voyager. So it was very obvious that Voyager was coming from the third planet out. So that gave then whoever might have picked us up an idea of which planet sent it out. And there was a lot of debate on that. You know, do we really want to tell somebody that picked it up out there exactly where we were? And then that section in the middle that looks like lines of maybe a star coming out, those are pulsars. And we have not talked about pulsars, and we'll talk about those when we get to stars. But pulsars basically are stars that are spinning with a very regular repeating spin. And so in binary code, you have the period of several known binary stars that are around the sun. And so it's thought then that whoever picked that up, if they recognize that that indeed is a pulsar, then they ought to be able to figure out which pulsars those are and kind of zero in on where the sun is. And then if you look at the very top, which in this diagram is labeled number two, by the way, guys, the actual plaque is not numbered one through, you know, four or five, things like that. But it is for purposes of being able to describe what's on this particular rendition of that plaque. Is you have the hydrogen molecule. The hydrogen molecule is the most common molecule in the universe by far. You know, originally, most everything that was created in the Big Bang was hydrogen. And so that's a representation of the hydrogen molecule which hopefully if you know, they're intelligent enough to be able to go out there and pick up Voyager and read this, then they'll realize that hydrogen is going to look like that no matter which language, culture, however you see, hydrogen has the same molecular formula. And so that kind of then is going to go ahead and anchor the fact that we know what hydrogen is. And then it's real hard to see on this picture, but then that's also written in binary code. So everything is done in binary codes, yes, no, on, off, those kinds of things. So that plaque went out on Pioneer 10 and 11. Then we have Voyager, and this is a picture of Voyager. And, and yeah, there's a huge description then of a lot of the instruments and things like that. And Voyager carried the same kind of plaque, only instead of a plaque, it was actually a record. This is a gold record. And we did go ahead and send a record player. And this has the same, somewhat the same information that was on uh, Pioneer. But here you also have recordings of all kinds of sounds that are produced on the Earth. Living uh, sounds of the wind, sounds of trains, sounds of babies crying, sounds of ice cracking, you know, all kinds of sounds um, that are from the Earth. And it's real interesting sometimes, guys, to go ahead and listen, go to the Internet, pull this up, and you can actually hear some of the sounds off of that record. So. Those are at least two of the more famous probes that were sent out. Then in 1995, we sent another probe to Jupiter that was specifically designed to look at Jupiter, and that was the Galileo probe. And then Cassini looked at Saturn 2004 is when it was uh, launched in more detail. What the Galileo did is it dropped a probe into the atmosphere of Jupiter. It lasted about 57 minutes. We got all kinds of good information from that. And now Galileo itself is in orbit around Jupiter. So Galileo and Cassini were simply meant to go to Jupiter and Saturn and not go any further. They were sent just to study those two planets. So let's talk about the properties of the gas giants. You can see Jupiter is about 318 times larger than the Earth in terms of its mass. 11 Earths would fit across the diameter of Jupiter. You can see the density there is 1.3 grams per centimeter cubed. 12 years to go ahead and rotate. Excuse me, 12 years to revolve around the Earth. Excuse me, revolve around the Sun. Sorry about that, guys. Notice though that last number, 10 hours to rotate on its axis. Jupiter is 11 times the size of the Earth in terms of its diameter. We rotate on our axis once every 24 hours. Jupiter rotates on its axis once every 10 hours. So in general, you're going to find that the larger the planet, the shorter the period of rotation. If I do the same kinds of things for Saturn, notice it's 11 hours to rotate. It's a little bit smaller than what Jupiter is. 
Only nine Earths would fit across its diameter. And guys, I'm going to have this information on Blackboard as well as an outline for this material. Because there's a lot of material we're going to cover talking about the gas giants. Okay, and it may all run together, but like I said, go check Blackboard for an outline and make sure you have that in front of you along with these four descriptions of the planets. There's Uranus. Notice that we've dropped significantly um, about the size of four Earths coming across the diameter. Density is about 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. You can see that it takes 17 hours to rotate on its axis. Same way with Neptune, right about the same. Notice how long it takes to go around the sun, 164 years. If you look at the density for Neptune, it's about 1.6 grams per centimeter cubed. Notice that Uranus is about 1.2. Notice what Saturn's density is. It's about 0.7 grams per centimeter cubed. Guys, the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed. So if you had an ocean big enough, Saturn would go ahead and float as a density less than that of water. So in terms of appearance and rotation, when we look at these gas giants, we always go ahead and really just see the outer gas layers. Okay? And there's really no solid surface, although a lot of times people tend to refer to the surface as that opaque layer that you see there. But realize it's not solid and you will not be able to go ahead and land on it. So we always see their outer atmospheres and whether or not we can see them in visible light, you tend to have belts um, or bands that then go ahead and go across the planet. And then you also see storms and clouds and things like that. Uh, Jupiter tends to have a banded appearance and is more flattened at the poles and it bulges at the equator because it's not rotating as a solid body. Very distinct colors in the bands. Reds, oranges, yellows, browns, whites, creams, all those kinds of things. And then Saturn is basically like that, has the same kind of bands, but is more butter butterscotch in color, much more muted than what Jupiter is. Uranus is nearly featureless. It's kind of a greenish blue in color, basically because it's made out of a lot more methane and in the outer atmosphere. And then Neptune is the same, only it's a little bit more blue due to scattering of the light. And there are a few white cirrus methane clouds that are going to be visible on the upper part of the atmosphere. And the cool thing about them is they tend to cast shadows. And so you can see down into some of the cloud features on there, and you can see the shadows that the clouds are, are going ahead and casting. Of course, the ring system, guys, obviously very visible on Saturn. Can't see them on Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, but they are there. In our next session, we'll go ahead and talk about what those rings are and how they're made, and are they there permanently, or are they only there kind of now, exactly what's going on. If I look at seasons and how the planets then are tilted on their axis, I find that Jupiter really has essentially no tilt of the axis, and so Jupiter doesn't really have any real seasons. Remember, guys, the reason that the Earth has seasons is because the axis tilted. So part of the time, you know, you have one hemisphere that's receiving the more direct rays of the sun. Then when the axis is tilted away from the sun, then you have that hemisphere is receiving more the indirect rays of the sun. Saturn and Neptune have about the same tilt, about 27 and 29 degrees. And so therefore, Saturn and Neptune do have seasons. And we think that we see storms forming on Saturn when we do get into some of the different seasons. And then we have poor little Uranus. Notice the tilt of Uranus's axis. I mean, it's tilted all the way over. I think something came in when the early solar system was forming and literally ran into Uranus and literally tipped it over. And so instead of really sitting upright and orbiting that way around the sun, Uranus kind of rolls around the sun, which means it has extremely extreme seasons. You know, part of that time, everything is facing toward the sun, so you have really that full-on summer. And then part of the time, everything's pointed away from the sun, so the other side then has definitely winter. Nothing in between, guys, either summer or winter. Now, in terms of composition and structure, 
in general, the further down you go into the planet, then the hotter you're going to get and the greater the pressure is. And that's true here on the Earth as well. I mean, that hasn't changed. The only difference is you don't really have the solid materials that we have here on the Earth. What you're going to end up with is more of that gaseous material that turns into a liquid material with lots of slushy material, depending on whether we're talking about Jupiter and Saturn or Uranus and Neptune. So guys, the core of each of the planet has temperatures greater than that of the surface of the sun. So that was not quite expected until we were able to send those probes out and really start doing some measurement out there and then trying to match our measurement with what we think that those planets actually look like. And so yeah, the temperatures and pressures inside the cores are certainly higher than the temperature on the surface of the sun, certainly not in the core, but on the surface as well as those high pressures. So Jupiter and Saturn, we think the core is probably relatively small and rocky. And notice, guys, I have an asterisk right there. I don't want you to think of rocky as being the same way that we use rocky here on the Earth, solid materials that actually form rocks. That name kind of stuck, and so they talk about rocky cores, but in reality, what they mean when they're talking about rocky cores of the four gas giants, is there more of kind of molten material made out of heavier elements than just hydrogen and helium? And then those areas above those cores are probably hydrogen and helium, and probably compressed and it's probably acting at least for the hydrogen like liquid metallic hydrogen. We're going to find out that that then is one of the ways that we think we have Jupiter's really strong magnetic field formed. So like I said, guys, the literature still refers to those cores as rocky, but it's more rocky as in elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium in that kind of molten material-like state. Then you get Uranus and Neptune. Again, they refer to it as a rocky core. But there again, guys, it's not rocks as we think of, but more of the fact that very hot, and you get this molten material that is composed of heavier elements than hydrogen and helium. We do think, remember I said that Uranus and Neptune are probably icy planets. There's a lot of slushy ice in there where our mantle would be. So above the core, you have the mantle, and we think that for Uranus and Neptune, because it's further out, it's going to have and not have quite as much energy associated with it. And that, that icy or slushy material is kind of like an ammonial ocean. Again, under high temperatures and pressures, possibly some water mixed in there, things like that. And then, of course, as with the other gas giants, you have layers of hydrogen and helium on the outside in that gas part surrounding then this mantle and the core. And those other chemicals include water, ammonia, you know, um, methane, silicon, all those other kinds of materials that we see, just not the way we see them here on the Earth. Lots of hydrocarbons. And you usually see those, like I said, in the upper part of the atmosphere. Now, let's talk about internal heat source. If we look at the four gas giants, I mean, those gas giants are really out there, guys. And yet, when we measure the amount of energy coming from those gas giants, they are giving off more energy than what they're receiving from the sun at that particular distance. So, something's got to be going on. You know, some of that heat is probably from the initial collapse of that material during the time that you're forming them. So, some of that is certainly remaining within the planet itself. If I think about Jupiter and Saturn, especially the larger ones. Um, so, that's going to have a an effect in terms of raising the temperature, but it's still higher than what would be expected from taking that into account and then just the heating effects of the sun. So something is going on inside. And so it's certainly giving off or radiating, whichever way you'd like to think, of more energy than they receive from the sun alone. You know, they've got that large internal energy source, especially Jupiter and Saturn. Uranus does radiate more energy, but it's certainly the coldest of the group. And remember, Neptune's further out, and yet Uranus is the one that's a little bit colder than that. So something else is going on in Neptune. Well, what could go ahead and cause that internal energy source to be produced? Well, like I said, certainly gravitational collapse. 
but you could also have particles that are falling inward. Now, if you have particles falling inward, that means you're going from an area of high potential energy to an area of low potential energy, and you're converting that potential energy then into kinetic energy, and kinetic energy then into heat. Also, there might be some radioactive decay in there. Radioactive decay is known for giving off energy. That's one of the heating sources within the core of the Earth is when we have radioactive decay and you have energy then that's given off. And so that then gets converted to heat. There might be other mechanisms that we're not sure about. We just know that when we measure that, they're giving off more energy than they receive. Like I said, guys, earlier I mentioned this is the best time for planetary geology because there's so much about these planets as well as the inner planets that we still don't have a real good feel for what's going on, why that's happening, what kind of chemical reactions can explain it. You know, lots and lots and lots of questions still to answer out there. Now, remember that when Pioneer headed out toward Jupiter, one of the things that Pioneer was to test was see if it would be able to survive that really strong magnetic field of... Jupiter. And so all of them do have a really strong magnetic field, and it's due to spinning fluids within the planet itself. Remember, guys, our magnetic field is due to that molten spinning iron and nickel core. So we don't have those same kinds of chemicals on the gas giant, so therefore what's going on inside that planet that's going to go ahead and produce that magnetic field? Like I said, Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of any of the planets. It's about 14 times that of what the Earth is, and we think that it is probably produced by a conductive liquid metallic hydrogen layer. What does that mean? Well, if I start out with hydrogen, it's kind of a gaseous hydrogen, and I start down into that mantle part of Jupiter, I find that there is kind of a transition, a very, very, very slow, gradual transition from gaseous hydrogen all the way down to liquid hydrogen. You're never going to find a liquid surface. That boundary is not going to be there. But it's just a gradual change all the way down to this metallic hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is metallic. You don't normally think of that as a metal. But it's on the left side of the periodic table, and hydrogen is extremely metallic. Well, if it's metal and it's in a liquid form, that means it's going to be able to give off current it's also going to be able to heat things very well. So it's going to conduct electricity. It's going to conduct heat. And so because Jupiter is spinning so rapidly, then it's going to continually keep this liquid metallic, car or liquid metallic hydro hydrogen in motion. And so we think that Jupiter's very strong magnetic field is produced by this layer. So it's conducting. It's rotating rapidly. And it's a really large area as this gradually changes down into that metallic hydrogen. So at least our hypothesis seems to make sense. Now we also know Jupiter is a source of radio waves, which is called synchrotron radiation. And again, we can kind of look at that and say, okay, what's going on there? And synchrotron radiation happens when you have really fast electrons, they're spiraling down into a magnetic field, and so that condition tends to fit what's going on within Jupiter because we see this type of radiation given off in the form of radio waves. Now, Neptune has a magnetic field that's offset from its axis of about 47 degrees, and so what's going on there? Well, we think that there's probably a thick layer of water ice, excuse me, of liquid water with ammonia and methane dissolved in it, not too far beneath that surface of the planet. And notice, guys, I did put surface in parentheses because that's what you kind of call that layer that's becoming opaque. And that dissolved material in the water, the ammonia and the methane and things like that, is going to cause that water to be conductive. And so we think that's why it has that kind of field that's offset by about 47 degrees because it's being produced not from a layer further down into the planet, but a layer of liquid that's closer to the surface and has conducting materials in it. Now, because each one of those planets have a really strong magnetic field, then that means those planets have really, really, really impressive auroral displays. I mean, think about the northern and southern lights on the Earth. We're going to find they're much, much larger 
on every one of the gas giants. And just like on the Earth, they're going to be centered more toward the poles. They're centered on the poles for the gas giants as well. Now, the atmosphere, which is basically where you do get most of those gases, tend to be composed of, hey, guess what, guys? Hydrogen and helium. And that helium, because it doesn't react with anything else, it's one of those noble gases, tends to be very hard to detect. But we know, based on the conditions and you know, the temperatures and things like that around there, that both the hydrogen and the helium will tend to go ahead and stay around. Certainly methane and ammonia, although Saturn has a little bit less helium, but it's the same kinds of chemicals that we see here on the Earth, just taking into account the planets are bigger, planets are cooler, and they're radiating a little bit more energy off than what they receive, and there's no solid material there for land masses to get in the way. We also have zones and bands of all, on all four of the planets. They're certainly more visible on Jupiter and then somewhat on Saturn, and we're going to find out that on Uranus and Neptune you can't see them unless you're looking at something other than visible light. So the zones tend to be light-colored bands on Jupiter, and they tend to have white ammonia cirrus clouds at the top, and they are simply regions of gas that is rising from below up to the surface of Jupiter. And so you're going to get, and when I show you these pictures of Jupiter, you're going to get these banded appearances, and you're going to get a light band, a dark band, a light band, and a dark band, and we think that those then are the tops where these big convection currents are bringing energy to the surface of Jupiter. So you have zones, which are light-colored bands, and then you have belts, which are dark-colored bands. Now, zones are where that material is rising. Belts are where the material is sinking. Okay, so it's colored bands. Again, you've got that cooler atmosphere, and it's sinking. So think about the fact that you've got these big convection currents. We see convection currents here on the Earth all the time. So you have material that gets heated. It rises to the top. It cools off. It goes ahead and sinks. A lot of times you've been swimming in Table Rock Lake or, you know, any of the big lakes around here. As you dive down, you may end up in a cold water current or a warm water current, things like that. But they're just these big convection currents where you have a large amount of mass moving. We think that the darker regions may come from compounds like ammonium hydrosulfide, those kinds of things. Like I said, the belts can be highly colored. You know, you, and again, when I show you these pictures, I mean, they're gorgeous colors. They're all these really neat earth tones, browns and oranges and reds and whites and creams and things like that, where if I look at the zones, the zones tend to be just kind of cream or white. And then you have really cool things happening where then the two are meeting. We find out that the belts continually seem to be twisting and swirling. They tend to be changing in appearance. And then, like I said, at the boundaries between the belts and the zones, you get a lot of that swirling and mixing as well. Exactly what's going on in that, we're not quite sure. Like I said, guys, all the gas giants do tend to have those bands of belts and zones, but a lot of times you can't see them in visible light for the outer two planets. You have to look at other ways. And then, of course, Saturn, when I show you pictures here, you'll see Saturn is certainly has them, but it's a much more muted version. And Saturn tends to be more of a kind of a yellowish hopscotch or butterscotch color than what Jupiter is. Now, we find that when we look at these belts and these zones, they have three distinct layers of clouds in them. The layer of ammonia clouds, of ammonium hydrosulfide, and then water. And it doesn't seem to matter which planet we're looking on then you still seem to have those bands. They certainly behave a little bit differently depending on temperature, pressure, size, rotation, all that other stuff. But the fact that they all have them tells me that there's something common in the way those things then were formed. Now, let's talk about the wind and weather. The thick atmosphere on all of those planets, many regions of highs and low pressures, you know, it's kind of like the Earth. When we have a really distinct separation between highs and lows, then you get a lot of wind. You have a really high gradient, pressure gradient, you get lots of winds. Well, we're seeing the same thing on the gas giants, only take away a lot of water, take away the fact that you have oceans, take away the fact that you have continents. And so we can look at the Earth and make those adjustments and start approaching then what the four gas giants look like. Now, 
we can kind of look at these cloud patterns, and by tracking those cloud patterns, you can kind of figure out what the wind speeds are. So winds tend to be faster due to faster rotational speed. There's no solid surface. You know, and then you've got this source of internal heat, and so that's also going to go ahead and produce faster winds. And so we find the winds on all four of the gas giants extremely high. Now Uranus's basic circulation is parallel with its equator because that poor little sucker is tipped over. And so its mass and ability to store heat are great enough so that, and it's so far out from the sun, that the sun's not going to have a whole lot of effect on its circulation patterns. Neptune, same kind of thing. Neptune's further out. But Neptune's got a little bit different uh, pattern due to the high equatorial winds. You know, Neptune and Uranus are awful lot alike with the, fact, with the exception of the fact that winds on Neptune are incredibly high. They're even higher than what Saturn's winds are. And not only are they faster than what Saturn's winds in the region are blowing, they're blowing backwards. They're blowing against the direction of the planet's rotation. So we call them in retrograde motion. Exactly why that's happening, not really sure. We also know within the atmosphere in those gas areas that we do see storms, and they seem to be superimposed on those regular circulation patterns. However, they are local disturbances. They're usually formed from rising gases. A lot of times they're high pressure regions. They tend to be oval in shape. Now, not necessarily, and I'm going to show you one on Saturn that's definitely not oval in shape that looks pretty cool, but in general, that's what they are. Now, guys, when I show you pictures of Jupiter, we're going to have Jupiter's great red spot here. And it's been seen for more than 300 years. It has changed somewhat in size. We think it's a big cyclonic storm. Uh, we have seen several ovals that have formed around Jupiter's red spot. Occasionally, those white ovals will uh, manage to run into the red spot, and the red spot seems to cannibalize them. You know, that storm has been around since Galilei observed it a number of years ago. So that's extremely stable. Neptune, on the other hand, had what was called a great dark spot. It seemed to be the same kind of thing, about 6,500 miles long. So guys, that means that is greater than the diameter of the Earth. So just like Jupiter's red spot, the great spot is definitely larger than the Earth. Uh, formed basically in the same latitude as Jupiter, kind of had the same shape, same relative size. Um, you know, it's kind of the same kind of thing. Um, however, it would kind of disappear or fade, and in fact now it's completely gone. And then in 1995, a new storm appeared in the northern hemisphere as opposed to the southern hemisphere, but notice it was gone also by 1995, so it wasn't around very long. And every 30 years or so, we seem to see an outbreak of spots in the equatorial region of Saturn, probably plumes and not real storms, and are also probably associated with Saturn's seasons. And more from that standpoint, as opposed to what's going on within Jupiter. So let's go ahead and what I want to do in the time that I have remaining is I've got a number of slides that I just kind of want to go through you and show you of the different planets. So let's start with Jupiter. You see the moon, um, and you see Jupiter there in the kind of middle right. Jupiter does show up very well when you look at it. Um, here you've got the moon, and you can see Jupiter in the lower right as well. And if you look closely, guys, you can see three of the four Galilean moons, the moons of Jupiter. And we will come back to those next time when we talk about the characteristics of those moons. I just couldn't resist this one. Having a gas here at Jupiter, that giant planet. And there's your red spot there. Um, talks about Jupiter there. There's the size of the poor little Earth down there in the lower right. So let's go see what that really looks like. Um, notice here's Jupiter. This is not taken from the Earth. This is taken by one of the flybys. There is a great red storm, depending on you know, how it's changed, the relative size. It can be up to about two and a half times the size of the Earth. It generally stays about one, one and a half, two times the size of the Earth. And it's relatively stable. You can see the zones and the bands there. 
excuse me, the zones and the belts. Um, the zones then tend to be that white area. The belt tends to be the kind of orangish color. And when I show you closer a little bit here, you can see there's all kinds of twisting motions within them. And then also in this picture down there toward the bottom, um, you can see three white ovals, so probably cyclonic storms as well, not nearly as stable as what the great red spot is. And they might migrate up and they might finally go ahead and either dissipate or they could run into the red spot and the red spot's going to basically cannibalize them. Um, this just kind of goes ahead and talks about the core, and I've got this picture on Blackboard for you, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, see Jupiter again, the zones and the belts. You can start seeing the boundary between them. Here you have one of the moons that's forming a, going through an eclipse, and that's that dark circle that you see then on the planet itself. This is an artist's conception of what Jupiter looked like when the probe went through it from Galileo. We are going to find out that there's a huge amount of lightning that you're going to see. And this is an actual picture colored, though artificial color, showing that transition. We find that that gas clouds that we see up at the top are really are very narrow. And right below it, it seems to be a very thin, transparent layer, and then you get into the next cloud surface or cloud layer. Just more pictures of Jupiter. That's showing the rotation of Jupiter. Up close, you can see some of the white ovals, some of that mixing there. That's the whole surface of Jupiter laid out flat. Nice picture of some ovals in the red spot. Just some close-ups, a little bit false color there, guys, on the boundaries and that twisting and mixing that you're going to see between the boundaries as well as within the belts themselves, those darker regions. So guys, you're just looking at layers of big convection currents rising and sinking, and then that mixing you're getting then at the very top part of it. close-up of some ovals. Okay, remember I said that Jupiter has lots of lightning strikes? Um, this was taken then where it's just showing the lightning strikes that are showing up. So everything you see on there is a lightning strike. We have auroras. This one is much, much, much larger than the Earth itself. But the same mechanisms account for this as account for the ones that we see on the Earth. That's just a picture of the radio waves from that synchron radiation that's coming out. I know it kind of looks like a little lizard with two heads, but basically it's the map of Jupiter laid out flat and showing you that radiation. That's taken in infrared light. And what you see on that little kind of uh, oval under one of those bands there is the red spot. These are a picture of Jupiter's rings, which we didn't find until we actually got out there. We're going to find they're a, bit, a little bit different than what Saturn's rings are. And so like I said, we'll kind of come back to these pictures the next time. So let's look at Saturn. Okay, you got the moon up there. you got Saturn down there. There's the moon and Saturn up there. And then you have um, like a launching that's over in the lower left, and that's why you get that kind of white material is just from a launch. You have both Jupiter and Saturn there, and a nice picture of the auroras. Oops, skip that one. Okay, there is Saturn, and you see some of the moons around Saturn. You know, lots and lots of moons around Saturn, and so we'll come back to that one tomorrow. But you can see the rings around Saturn. And those rings, remember, were first observed by Galileo. He couldn't really tell exactly what they were. He just thought Saturn had handles on there. His telescope simply wasn't good enough to really go ahead and show up the rings well. Remember I said Saturn had those bands, which were the belts and the zones, but again, they're much more muted. I'm just going to kind of go through these pictures. That's a picture of Saturn in infrared light and heat. That's an X-rays. Kind of surprised that Saturn was giving off X-rays. 
This is another picture of Saturn. One of the pictures, uh, one of the ovals that formed in that upper atmosphere of Saturn. And then this shows the moon, okay, and Saturn coming out from the back of the moon. And there's the actual video that came with it. It kind of looks like Saturn is standing still and the moon is moving, but you know, really the, we're following Saturn, so the Saturn is coming out from behind. So the moon basically eclipsed or occulted Saturn. We will talk about the rings tomorrow and the fact that they will change their orientation. So sometimes you'll actually see rings, sometimes you won't because you're looking at a edge on. There's auroras in the atmosphere of Saturn. Okay, this is one of those storms. Notice it is not a nice oval, it's called the dragon storm. You know, is it really a cyclonic storm or is it just a plume or exactly what it is? Now, this, on the other hand, is one of the, at the poles of Saturn, and that's an eight-sided figure, excuse me, six-sided figure. And exactly what's going on there, we're not really sure. But guys, that thing is larger than the Earth. Another picture of the rings of Saturn. I know I'm going pretty quick here, guys, but I know this has been a long session. I'd kind of like to get done in 55 minutes. Now, I want you to look at this picture. This is an artificial picture where they have then eclipsed then um, the planet itself to bring out the structure of the rings. Now, there's a little bitty dot within that yellow circle. Can't hardly see it if I take that off. But guys, that little bitty dot right there is the planet Earth. That's us, as seen from Saturn. And we're actually looking at the Earth through Saturn's rings. I thought that was kind of an awesome picture. Can't hardly see it, can you? But if you look real close, right there is the Earth on that little dot right in the center of that yellow circle. The rings of Saturn, the spokes, we'll come back and talk about those the next time. And so I want to go on then, and I'm going to skip these because we'll kind of pick those up tomorrow. And let's talk about Uranus. Uranus is kind of not real exciting, you know, especially not like Jupiter and Saturn and the rest of them. But it's okay in its own right. It's lots of moons. You know, there it is. Kind of this greenish blue. Nothing really exciting. You can't see Dan. Basically, you see that featureless surface. If you take a long view of that and go ahead and try and bring out the differences, then yeah, you definitely are going to start seeing some separation of what the surface feature look like, but cloud features look like, but you have to really take a long exposure there. Kind of gives you the size of the Earth compared to Uranus. A lot of times you will see it more of a greenish blue. This one kind of shows it up more of the blue. But it is, when you look at it through a telescope, more that greenish blue. I mean, more like this. You can see that if you look at it under the right conditions, using the right type of light, you can get those bands to show up. And you can see, it looks like what you've got, maybe some storms or things like that in there. Just another picture where I've kind of reversed and laid it out in a different orientation. And that's what happens when you look at those rings and you're trying to artificially eclipse that, but to bring out the ring system of Uranus. And then we've got Neptune. It's a little bit more exciting. This is a picture taken when that dark storm was still there. And it is definitely bluer than what Uranus shows up. There's also other clouds. And then you're seeing those nice cirrus clouds up there, and that's a white wispy cloud that you see. Just a close-up of the dark storm which, by the way, guys, like I said, is not here now. And there's a picture of close-up of the cirrus clouds, and then you're kind of seeing those shadows down below. 
and that's taken with um, a different light other than visible light, so you're using different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So with that, guys, that ends what we talked about with the gas giants. I said I didn't want to go ahead and spend as much time on them as I did the other planets. I think the terrestrial planets are a little bit more interesting, and more importantly, we have more information about them. So with that, guys, what I want to do then next time is go ahead and talk about the moons and the rings, and then we'll head on out into comets and asteroids. So with that, guys, I'll see you next time.